Hello everyone. Today I'm here to talk to you about how we improve the performance of service-to-service -service interactions using Envoy at the Wikimedia Foundation. Now, today I'll start with uh, introducing you to our infrastructures, explain why Envoy made sense in uh, that context. I'll explain briefly how the transition went, how we went through the transition of introducing Envoy in production, and finally I'll focus on what we gain from this. Let's start with the introduction, who we are. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is the non-profit organization that runs the infrastructure that supports Wikipedia and its sister projects like Wiktionary or Wikidata. We do uh, quite a lot of traffic monthly. We get one, 21 billion page views. This is the data from last August. Now, how is our infrastructure structured? We have five data centers, three of which are just caching pops. So they are just points of presence that only host the caching layer, uh, while uh, the two main data centers uh, are here in blue and green and are both located in the United States, one in Virginia and the other in Dallas, and they host our whole uh, application stack. Now, what happens when uh, somebody makes a request, let's say from uh, Africa, uh, somebody connects to uh, Wikipedia, they will be directed by GeoDNS to the nearest point of presence, which is ESAMS. If the um, visitor is uh, logged in, uh, or if a page is not present, their traffic will be sent to the application layer data centers and the response will be fetched back from there, computed and fetched back from there. If a user is surfing anonymously and the page has been seen uh, in the last day, uh, then they will get directly response from the caching data center. Now, our main data centers that run the application stack, um, our uh, system is uh, a mix of uh, some applications, microservices running on Kubernetes, and some stuff still to be moved to Kubernetes from our legacy environment, which is basically physical hosts. Um, one of these applications is our uh, de facto mon old monolith, uh, which is MediaWiki. Uh, the other peculiarity of MediaWiki is that while most of the other um, applications can run, can serve traffic from both that main, the main data centers. MediaWiki is active passive, meaning it can only serve the traffic from one data center at a time. This means that um, services uh, from one data center might fetch stuff from the MediaWiki API and the other data center, but also that MediaWiki might need to connect to data stores or other services in both data centers. Uh, as an example, um, let's say that when, when you get, we get an edit, we need to, to notify our Elasticsearch clusters that power the search box on, on Wikipedia about the fact that that article has been modified. <clears throat> now, uh, we have independent clusters in the two data centers, so we need to send the update to both. And this means that some of the traffic will go across data center. The, line, the arrows in red here. And this means that while we encrypted a long time ago, the traffic between the edges, the caching pops, and the main data centers, we didn't encrypt this traffic, the traffic between applications, which means that this traffic cross data center was going in the clear. Now, uh, if the last 10 years taught us anything is that if you run more than one data center, you really want the communications across data centers to be encrypted because that makes the life of state nation actors harder when they want to snoop on the data of your users. And so we needed to introduce TLS in front of all of our application. Now, we could have asked every development team to uh, develop, uh, to add TLS termination to their application, but that would have meant asking all these teams to become somewhat experts in uh, configuring a TLS stack. And at the same time, it would have meant that we would have to track the security defects in multiple application stacks. So we decided pretty early, we're going to install a TLS termination sidecar. 
Now, we choose Envoy for a VET function for a series of reasons. The first one is Envoy is not open core as some other TLS terminating proxy. Um, then there was reason of performance. We've seen reports that uh, Envoy is blazingly fast. And I told you before, our logged in users always get sent back to the main data centers. Uh, now, the logged in users are typically the editors, the people that add, info, add content to the wikis. Um, and these are, in some ways, our most valued users because they are the ones that build the projects that make them successful. And these users already pay a price for their loyalty by always being sent to the main, uh, main data centers. The reason for that is that when you're logged in, you can change the interface, the appearance of the site. So we can't just send you a cached copy. Now, we didn't want our introduction of encryption between services to uh, add another penalty to this use. And apart from this, uh, Envoy has been designed to be the perfect service-to-service -service middleware. So it has a series of characteristics that we really uh, wanted to add, one of which is its observability features. It adds telemetry between all services. Uh, it gives you the ability to emit tracing um, data. Uh, it has some uh, additional things that you want when you build a through microservices infrastructure like rate limiting and circuit breaking built into the proxy so that you can have a common implementation across services. And finally, it's very easy to compute. Yeah, no, I, I was joking. And this is kind of a cheap shot, uh, but there is a reason why I'm naming configuration and it will be clear in a couple of slides. So let's move, we understood why, which is Envoy. Let's move to how we did the transition. Um, again, Wikipedia has uh, our very high traffic. So we run a very large website with um, a lot of edge cases and a ton of traffic. Uh, if, one, if working uh, at the foundation for six years taught me anything is that there was always an edge case. So we wanted to proceed with uh, a certain level of caution. And that meant that we uh, divided the transition into phases. First, we introduced uh, TLS termination in front of all services. And we made the other services call them the HTTPS. And then only in the second moment, we started introducing configuration in Envoy to be able to act as a service proxy, through service proxy, and uh, reconfigure the applications to use it progressively. Now, the problem that we faced during the transition, the biggest problem that we faced during the transition is that the co configuration of Envoy is very complex. It's well documented, but the, there is a steep learning curve, and we didn't feel that everybody uh, in the team needed to become an expert on Envoy. Uh, also, we had the problem that we had two different templating engines, one for Kubernetes, that's Elm, and one for the uh, legacy environment, that's Puppet. So we needed to have basically a common template with just where we sadly had to re-implement just the templating uh, primitives, but we wanted to have the same data structure uh, defining uh, listeners and clusters for Envoy to be used both by uh, Kubernetes and the legacy environment. And we wanted this to be simple and easy to understand to any SRE, even if they have uh, no prior experience with Envoy. We came up with a simple YAML data structure. Here is an example that's taken from our configuration. Um, this example doesn't have all the keys that you can define, but this is a good portion of them. And basically, our design goal was any SRE that is 15 lines of documentation and is able to add a basic listener to the Envoy configuration. The other goal that we had was for this to be boring. And when I say boring, I mean that we didn't want to have surprises. Once you have Envoy mediating all your HTTP traffic between microservices, changing something in its configuration becomes really scary because the blast radius is huge. I want to uh, make a shout out to uh, the Envoy devs for adding mode validate to the server so that it allowed us to easily catch any errors that we were introducing in uh, the configuration directly in uh, the continuous integration environment. And some investment in making your configuration, uh, con uh, continuous integration environment, check that the configuration is doing what ex it expects to do is really something you should invest. Now, uh, all transitions that 
happen in real life happen with some struggles. I want to name some of the struggles we had. And the first and foremost was we use a level four load balancing, which means that we balance connections, IP connections, and not requests. Now, Envoy tries to funnel as many requests as, possi requests as possible across the same connection. That's one of his strengths, one of the reasons that we made big gains later. But this also means that it makes it very bad to be uh, load balanced through a connection-based load balancer uh, because you can send 1 million requests across one connection and three, connect three requests across another connection. You've balanced these connections across the backends, but you didn't balance the requests, which is what you really want to balance. So what we did was just to limit the number of requests that you can send over one single connection to 1,000 by default. And that was enough to make the problems that I was naming go basically go away. We also had another problem, um, which was we did see, um, especially uh, for the applications that run at high scale, so thousands and thousands of requests per second, that we had some mysterious um, connection timeouts, uh, connection failures, sorry, happening um, from time to time. And we trick it back to the fact that application servers typically um, define um, a keep a lifetime out for uh, HTTP connections so that they can basically kill uh, a connection that's kept alive by the client if the client doesn't send any data over that connection for more than n seconds. And uh, turned out that basically we had to uh, account for that in Envoy as well. Uh, let me go back to the example I made before. Here we define the keep alive, which becomes an idle timeout in uh, Envoy speak of 4.5 seconds because this uh, application and then gate analytics is a Node.js application and Node.js by default um, as an idle timeout of five seconds. So just keep that value a bit smaller in, on the Envoy side than on the server side, and all these errors that we had go away. And finally, since we didn't cho we choose to not go with the Istio way and just make all routing through Envoy transparent to the application by using IP table sorceries, uh, and we decided to actually go and change the configuration of the application to uh, find a request through Envoy. Also, because we, this way we could just switch one backend at a time if we need to. Uh, well, the problem is that sometimes the same configuration key is used for uh, finding the upstream servers to call and also to output some data to the user, like a C a, the URL for a CSS. And thus, when you use localhost 5603 in a configuration for um, our mobile application service, you might break mobile Wikipedia like I did. The point is just, it's not always uh, cost-free to change the configuration of a service to point to localhost. But let's go to the, back to the good news. As I said before, the, one of the reasons we choose Envoy for was performance. Now, we knew performance uh, is great uh, in Envoy, but what we didn't expect is that we would actually improve the performance of our stack by introducing Envoy. And the reason for that is PHP. Now, it's easy to dunk on PHP, but it's also undeniable uh, that for all its flows, it's very successful. It's used to run some of the largest website in, websites in the world. And the create, one of the creators of HHVM, Keith Adams, uh, has written, has argued that the reason for, for PHP's success is its scoping which means the scope of any uh, of execution of a PHP script in a web server is the web request. So at the start of a web request, you start with basically an empty scope. You have nothing besides some globals and the request um, variables. And then you have to build anything. You have to allocate memory. You have to um, build anything you need to make all the connections you need. And at the end of a request, everything, the memory you allocated, the file descriptors is open, everything is thrown away. You can see how this uh, makes it very, very easy to write uh, a web application PHP without having to worry about memory leaks or such stuff. At the same time, this gives you another unique advantage, which is um, serving requests concurrently in PHP is incredibly easy. You have to do nothing to be able to do that because every request is atomic by default. So there is, it's shared, it's shared nothing architecture where 
you can run things in parallel as much as you as you want. Uh, this is an approximation. Forgive me if you know PHP better. You are probably saying, "Well, actually, at this point." But for this, the sake of the argument, let's just assume that nothing is shared between requests. This means that also you can share things like connection pools. And this means that whenever your PHP application has to call other services, it needs to create a new connection for every request it needs to make. Uh, and this is a cost. But this cost is even bigger if your connection is using TLS. Because when you use TLS, you have at least two additional round trips to account for. I'm saying at least because it depends on a series of factors, but it's at least two round trips. It's one if you get to TLS 1.3, but good luck using TLS 1.3 from PHP. Um, then there's the cost of establishing actually the TLS connection from the computational point of view. You have to exchange a certificate. Uh, you have to exchange secrets. Uh, you have to recreate for every request the session tickets on the server side because, as we said, shared nothing on the client side. So what we expect is basically that this will be introduce higher CPU usage, higher network usage, and in the case you have latency over your network, also latency to the applications. Now, <clears throat> I said before, it's a bit more complex than uh, saying share nothing. Uh, that's because um, PHP extensions are written in C, and they can bypass the shared nothing uh, behavior of PHP. And in fact, Curl ex Curl the curl extension, which is what everybody uses to make remote HTTP calls in HHVM, allows you to predefine shared, shared connection pools for specific host names, remote host names. In Zen PHP, which is what we are using, this is not possible at all. There is no way to do that. So we knew uh, that um, introducing TLS, especially for requests that went cross data center, could make us pay a big price. And we wanted to test how much. And to do that, we just did this very, very small benchmark of cross DC performance in our production environment. We just wrote a small script that would call, would fetch using the PHP curl extension, uh, the Elasticsearch banner page from the other data center, which is 35 milliseconds, uh, more or less, a front trip away. And then we called this script with a concurrency of 100 under three different conditions. In one case, we pointed the script to fetch the data from um, directly from Elasticsearch, but using the HTTP endpoint, so no encryption. We got 720 requests per second of throughput. Then we configured it to connect to uh, Elasticsearch directly, but using TLS. And the performance was severely reduced. And finally, we configured Envoy on the same machine uh, to uh, manage connections to Elasticsearch, and we made the PHP script connect to Envoy on localhost. So the connections were encrypted, but mediated by Envoy. And in this case, we obtained 1,050 requests per second, which is more than double that we got with direct calls, and much, much better even than direct calls with no encryption. Now, take these numbers with um, some discretion. Uh, there is a large error bars like uh, across those numbers, but still, it's 120 throughput gain when we use Envoy for TLS calls uh, to a remote data center. OK, this would solve our problem. We want to call encrypted across data centers, and we don't want to lose performance. Uh, which meant that we started the migration to uh, of phase two of a migration of introducing Envoy as a middleware from our biggest application, which is using PHP, which is MediaWiki, instead of starting like it's customary for an SRE from a smallish service that we don't um, worry too much about. Uh, the gain that we were uh, seeing in front of us was too large to ignore, so we started from there. And let's see uh, what happened. So we said before, we expect to get gains of latency, mainly across data centers. We expect to get a reduction in the CPU and network. Let's see what happened uh, when we transitioned the, uh, the use, uh, to the use of Envoy for ses calling Session Store from the wiki. Session Store, uh, you can guess from the name, is just a small Golang application that is used to manage uh, user sessions and to provide that, that data to other services, uh, first of all, MediaWiki. 
at the time of the transition, uh, just w about one quarter of a wiki of a wiki traffic was using session store. So MediaWiki was doing 4,500 requests per second to uh, session store. And still, uh, at the moment of the transition, you can see here that the CPU usage from all the pods of session store uh, went from 2.5 seconds per second, so 2.5 CPUs, to about 0 0.7 CPUs. This is amazing, but let's see what happened with the network. Uh, so for the network, the effect was even more unexpected. Uh, what we saw was a big drop in the uh, number of bytes exchanged, and we expected that. But we also saw that the difference between transmitted and received data basically uh, disappeared because we weren't transmitting continuously the TLS certificate 4,500 times per second, but just a few times per minute. OK, this is, all looks very good, right, on paper. But uh, what about the latency, which is what we really care about, because that's what the users see. And uh, the latency of both the service and MediaWiki was reduced significantly. Let's see how. So this is um, the latency buckets um, traced for the session store service. You can see here below that the green line, which is requests that be, are served in less than one millisecond, doubled, basically, at the time of the transition. At the same time, the number of requests that took over 10 milliseconds almost disappeared. So good effects on the latency of uh, session store. Let's see if it had any effect on MediaWiki. Let's always remember it was about one fourth of the traffic that was affected by the, uh, the transition, because only one fourth of the traffic was, served by session, was using session store at the time. And at the time of the transition, you can see here that the number of requests, the percentage of requests that MediaWiki was responding to in less than 100 milliseconds went from about 21%, 20, between 20 and 22, it went to be between 27 and 25. So a 5% increase in the number of responses that took less than 100 milliseconds. Not super shocking as a result, but still pretty impressive if you keep in mind that we did no optimizations at the application layer. Now, these gains depend on volume, and I want to uh, show it to you with a couple of more graphs. This is um, of two different deployments of the same application. It's a REST gateway to, uh, to Kafka, basically. Uh, one getting 2,000 requests per second from MediaWiki, and in this case, the CPU re re usage reduction is about 25%. And one where it gets 13,000 requests per second. And in this case, the CPU usage reduction was 40%. So you have to keep in mind that how much you gain by introducing um, something that does persistent connections on behalf of PHP depends on the volume, of course, that you make. If you're in the, in, in the range of making hundreds of calls per second, probably this is not very important for you. But still, there are other things that we gained that are applicable even to small-scale um, uh, infrastructures. And one is, as I told you before, PHP runs active passive. So at some point at the start of September, we switched which data center we were serving MediaWiki from, because we want from time to time to uh, verify that the infrastructure is sound and working healthy in both data centers. Everything went good, but overnight we noticed that the save times reported from end users doubled uh, for saving edits. Now, normally, you have no idea where to look because it's um, anything, everything basically is, is working fresh for MediaWiki, all of it's stuck. So you have to figure out which part is not working as expected. Thanks to using Envoy, we were able to pinpoint within minutes. Uh, where the problem was, it was an upstream service called the Envoy, and to find the solution. Um, this was a huge advantage compared to anything that we had before. Also, in addition to that, circuit breaking in uh, Envoy is amazing, even in its default configuration. Um, we have some services that MediaWiki calls basically on every request. And if one of those services works too slow, uh, traditionally, would have basically all the requests um, piling up in PHP, waiting for a response from this remote service because we couldn't be too aggressive with timeouts. 
but introducing Envoy, even if it's default configuration, Envoy would uh, detect that too many timeouts were received from the remote service and start considering it unhealthy and just returning fast errors to MediaWiki, which means that MediaWiki was still able to operate. Even though it was in a degraded state, it was maybe not reporting statistics about visits, but still it was serving pages to the users, which is what we care most, mostly about. Finally, just one notice, uh, we, I want to say that we still have some edge scratchers that's normal, that's expected when you're transitioning to use something completely new. Uh, it will take time to iron all, all them out, but overall, <clears throat> I think this was an unmitigated success. Uh, by using Envoy, we were able to uh, encrypt all the communications between our services to add a, a lot of observability to, uh, to them, and uh, we were able to chromatically improve uh, the performance of our PHP applications. And really, anyone running a, a PHP application at scale should think of uh, doing something like this. Well, thank you for your time. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Uh, I just want to point out that you can see all of our dashboards that the graphs that I showed you uh, are taken from at grafana.gigmedia.org. And you can talk to us on Freenode, on IRC on Freenode. Um, and my team is Irene. Thank you very much with this final uh, blameless plug. I just uh, thank you all for listening. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So first of all, yes, Jake uh, is asking, uh, when I'm saying circuit breaking, I'm talking about the concept of circuit breaking. And in the case of Envoy, in terms of Envoy's terminology, it's outlier detection in this case, yes. Sorry. I should have been I should have been clearer. I realized why I was listening now. So I think I answered more in the chat already because I knew that I was running a bit late with the time. Um, so I see that Derek was asking uh, if the auto starter works differently than swapping config files. We wanted to use the uh, um, the hot starter anyways uh, for things that are not running Kubernetes because we don't want to we want to racially serve all the requests whenever we have to restart Envoy. So at that point, it was natural to just use it, just change the files. We have a procedure to build the files, basically, on via Puppet and um, deploy them, the configuration files. And then just we, we just send a, a, SIG, a, a SIG term, a, a SIG HUP to, um, to the other starter and just starts again and uh, any, any, um, a new um, Envoy uh, to run the new configuration. Also, from what I remember, if the configuration is wrong, the old version should keep working. From what I remember, but maybe it changed over uh, the last year. OK, I didn't see other questions. If I missed any, please just tell me. Uh, ask them again. Some time machine loading failures during hot restart. Uh, no. Interesting. I didn't. Uh, we didn't experience that, but probably we we're not running. We're not running Envoy at the edge. We're just running it between the services internally. So every Envoy is really doing the amount of requests that probably could trigger that. Uh, Every envoy is running at pretty low scale if you if you want, right? It's running some maybe a thousand requests per, per second overall at peak. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Have a nice rest of the conference. <laughs>